Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone. I am so excited to uh, have you all here tonight. We're going to just give everyone another second to get into the Zoom room. Um, if you're just joining us, use the chat to go ahead and tell us where you're Zooming in from. It's a beautiful night here in Philadelphia on Election Day. So let us know where you're coming in from and we'll just get started in just a moment. Great. Oh, we got some local folks. We got some folks from far away, as far away as other time zones. So exciting. Arizona and West Coast even. Good to see you all. Good afternoon to you as well. Great. So I'm going to just get started in just a second. So welcome everyone. I'm so delighted to welcome you tonight. My name is Justina Barrett and I am the Director of Education and Programs at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. HSP was founded in 1824 and we proudly serve as Philadelphia's Library of American History. Our collection contains over 21 million manuscripts and they hold the stories of all Americans with particular emphasis on early American history, ethnic and minority groups, science and industry, the arts, and of course, genealogical research. I am so happy to be hosting tonight's program and our monthly talks for you as well, our audience of family and community historians. HSP's comprehensive collections make us a one-stop shop for all of your genealogical research. We have immigration records, death and burial records, church records, including all of the records of the Archdiocese of Philadelphia through a partnership with Find My Past. And we have on-site digital access to Ancestry, Family Search, Heritage Quest, News Bank, and more. We, we have materials from every state east of the Mississippi River, as well as the Caribbean, Canada, and Europe. So let's get started just a minute. I have a few more housekeeping notes for us. Uh, there is closed captioning. You should see the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. Uh, we are recording tonight's program and we will send it to you in a follow-up email tomorrow. We are in webinar format and that means we can't see you and you can't see each other, so we will be interacting with you through the Q&A box. And we do have time for questions at the end, but as you get questions throughout the webinar, you can go ahead and use that Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we'll get to them. Uh, hopefully we'll get to them. Um, we may have lots of questions for Katie and Sandy tonight. So tonight we're hosting a conversation between two genealogists. One of them has been associated with HSP for 35 years and the other one is brand new to us. Sandy Hewlett uh, has, has over 40 years of genealogical experience. She has come up through the New England Historic Genealogical Society, attending their trainings and conferences. She learned all about Pennsylvania history and records uh, by volunteering with us at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania in our library starting in the late 1980s. And she has over 20 years of professional genealogical um, service to her clients. She's a member of the Association of Professional Genealogists. She has been a board member with us on our board of counselors at HSP. She has served on our genealogical advisory group as well as on our committee, um, uh, our programs and library committee. So Sandy, can you come off mute and just say hello for a second? Can you say hello? Come off mute. You're still on mute. There you are. There we are. I thought I had unmuted myself some time ago, but it muted again. So anyway, here I am. Good to have you, Sandy. Thank you. And you just stay on the screen because I'm going to be handing it over to you in a real second. Um, and here tonight we have HSP's newest addition to our staff, Katie Barnes, who serves as the newly appointed Director of Genealogical Services and Programs. This is a new full-time position at HSP and we are so excited to have her join our staff. Katie comes to HSP from Legacy Tree, Genealog sorry, Legacy Tree Genealogists in Salt Lake City. 
where she spent seven years as a senior editor and researcher across a wide range of geographic specialties. She earned a bachelor's degree in family history and genealogy from Brigham Young University. Katie was born in Atlanta, grew up in Texas, started her career in Utah, and now has landed here in Pennsylvania. Welcome, Katie. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good evening. And before I turn it over to both of you, I would love to get a sense of our audience tonight. Uh, you are coming to us from so many places, but have any of you ever researched in our libraries? So take a minute to take our poll so we can get a sense of where you all have been. Obviously, some of you are not local, so maybe you have in the past. And I am seeing, oh, it's a, it's almost a split. I love it. We have, we have 56% of you who have been in our, in our reading room at 13th and Locust and 44% of you that have never been. So I love that we have uh, people familiar with us and folks who have never been with us. So thank you. So good to see you all. Okay. That was just fun. I'm going to end the poll and I'm going to turn it over to my friends, Sandy and Katie, do you want to take it away? And we're going to get to know you both. Thanks so much. Thank you, Justina. And thank you, Katie, for joining us tonight. I'm excited about this talk and delighted that Katie has become HSP's new Director of Genealogy Services and Programs. In my over 30 year affiliation with HSP, this is the first time I've worked with someone solely responsible for genealogy at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. So welcome, Katie. Thank you so much. No pressure, right? <laughs> no pressure, no. Just over 20 million manuscripts and millions of other records and a lot to be in charge of, but I think your background is perfect for us. Well, thank you. And speaking of background, talk about your background, if you would, please. Well, I can, you know, start with some personal details. Justina covered it pretty well, but um, I did grow up in North Texas, but I live in the Mountain West for the last 13 years or so, and just recently landed in Philadelphia a little over a month ago. Um, on a more personal note, I am an avid traveler and hiker, an extremely amateur snowboarder, and lover of all things food, long walks and cemeteries, all the usual genealogy nerd things. Um, I also have, and I hope there's still the slide, but I have two very cute elderly dachshunds, weenie dogs who get their own slide in the PowerPoint. Um, I'm doing my best to ensure that they don't make their presence known tonight, but I do apologize if you hear some noise from them. They are dachshunds at the end of the day, which means that they are very noisy. Um, yeah, there they are. Real cute, right? Uh, and as Justina said, I did attend BYU and I graduated with a bachelor's degree in family history and genealogy, which was a really great opportunity. And what was it like for you attending BYU with all those other genealogists in a genealogy course five days a week? Um, it was a lot, you know, it was, it was a great opportunity because BYU is to date, I believe the only university in the nation that has a full bachelor's degree in genealogy. You know, there are other schools that have associate's degrees and certifications, but not, you know, entire undergraduate programming on the topic. Um, and BYU is a pretty large school. I want to say there were about 30,000 students there when I was attending, but the yeah. genealogy program was on the small side, 75 to 100 students. Um, so it was pretty small and tight knit and great way to build relationships and networks. Um, and one of the things I really liked about it there was that the program, you know, it's hard to compare it to certain other programs that I haven't done, but I liked that BYU was very history centric and not just focused on research methodology because, you know, as we all know, genealogy, to do genealogy well requires you to be a good historian as well. Um, for example, I had to write a capstone paper that was historical in nature and not genealogical. Um, and don't ask me to go into too much detail on what that was about. It just had something to do with old cookbooks and how 
in their discussions of food, they managed to give clues about politics and international relations. Basically, it was the French digging at the English, you know, and talking about butter a lot. So. Well, you have a nice background for HSP's renowned cookbook collection. Yes. But what was your favorite course at BYU? Um, I really enjoyed paleography, which is a study of reading the old handwriting. And that seems like it should just be something that comes along with the territory, but it really is something that you have to study. Um, and one of the things I really liked about that course was that it was very hands-on. There was a portion of the class where you had to use like a pen nib to quills and ink and parchment to learn to form the letters um, in the various ways that they were used in the past on the theory that if we were getting that tactile feedback, we would understand on paper how they were written and it would help us read them better. I ended up doing that in both English and Spanish, which helped my career immensely. Um, and then the class also, this is where this image comes from, involved multiple sessions in BYU special collections where we had hands-on practice with these beautiful 16th and 17th century English land indentures. Um, they were written on vellum and you had to unroll them and uh, we had to learn how to transcribe them and then analyze them. And it was just a really great experience that genealogy is so much more fun when you can uh, physically interact with the documents themselves. It was a great experience. No question of serendipitous finds are always best with an original document. Well, you obviously, since you went to BYU uh, to major in genealogy, how did you get into genealogy and what excites you about it? Um, you know, I've always been a, a history buff and a bit of a bookworm, but there was one inciting incident that, you know, I always think of now which is that when I was about 16 or 17, some of my much older extended family um, decided to pool their resources and put in a headstone for a shared ancestor we had that died in the 1890s, uh, who was my second great grandfather. You can see his headstone there. That's the one my family put in. Um, this was in rural Clay County, Texas, and you know, dusty old forgotten cemetery. And we all picnicked among the gravestones and put in the marker and um, this guy kind of ended up piquing my interest in genealogy because at the time he was a little bit of a, a brick wall as far as what my family knew about the Trout family, which is my mother's paternal, direct paternal line. Um, you know, ended up learning that he came alone to Texas from Maryland and was of German heritage. So that research is still kind of ongoing, but um, I, I owe a lot to David here. Um, but then my path to professional genealogy was a little bit more circuitous and I think well-rounded. Um, to make a, a long story short, I came into university as a music major actually, but ultimately after a semester or two decided that wasn't really where I wanted to go. And then fast forward through the next couple of years, I was kind of a little bit all over the place in terms of um, my interests, which were honestly scattered across various corners of liberal arts and social sciences. So. I was taking classes in journalism and anthropology and Spanish and all of these things, but I ended up taking a genealogy course. It was actually a history course entitled um, The Family and Law in American History with Dr. Catherine Danes, who was amazing. And it was that class where I fell in love with genealogy as an intersection of all of these other things that I love, this history and writing and law and so many of these other things. So genealogy is very intellectually stimulating and I love that about it. Well, how did you get from BYU into your professional career before you came to HSP? You know, that you used the word serendipitous earlier, and I think that describes it pretty well. Um, so, you know, to all you parents of liberal arts students out there, there is hope, but um, there's serendipity too. Um, I started with a couple internships, and then I had a long research assistantship with one of my professors, just trying to get as much experience under my belt as I could. And the timing just so happened to work out that a position uh, as a genealogical editor with their research firm came available. Right as I was graduating, um, I took that job, which ended up being an education in and of itself, and spent over seven years there, uh, mostly in research and editing. Uh, so I got to really lean into the back end of genealogy. They're doing research, editing papers. I mean, it, I found it really rewarding detective work. If you're the kind of person that 
I liked writing papers in college with, you know, the footnotes and everything, then professional genealogy research is for you. And if not, yeah, congrats on being normal. Um, the rest of us, you know, are <laughs> doing it. But you interacted with the, the clients as well as creating the research reports? Yeah, for a while. Um, the project management uh, liaison side ended up not being where I wanted to settle there, but I did do that as well. And that was, that was nice too, helping people figure out to synthesize their thoughts about what they wanted us to find. You know, people could come to us with brick walls they wanted us to solve or on the opposite end, people who didn't know anything about their ancestry beyond their parents or grandparents and just wanted us to kind of start at the beginning and uh, go through the whole tree and start digging in there. So um, that, that was very nice too. Do you have some research specialties? I do. So <laughs> the nature of that job meant that my experience was pretty broad. I developed a pretty wide range of skills, which I really liked. Um, if anything, I, I kind of became an expert at figuring out how to figure things out. But I will say that I typically like and prefer to do post-1850 United States research, um, especially biographies. And I've also focused heavily on Latin America, particularly Mexico and Puerto Rico. Um, and that latter work is something I'm bringing with me to HSP as an area that I hope to expand on here as well. Yeah, with our bulge collection and access to family search, I can imagine you can well expand that yes. even in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Did any of your research projects lead you to Pennsylvania resources? Some of my work did, but most of that was my, uh, my personal interests. I have a couple German ancestral lines that lead back to Pennsylvania, as so many of them do. And immediately upon moving out here, I wasted no time within my first month going out on a field trip to Lebanon County. Um, thanks, shout out to my friend and German research expert, Tim Feidler of the Genealogical Society of Pennsylvania. He helped me scope things out out there. Um, so yeah, that's ongoing as well. And in a way, uh, my move back east feels a little bit like a homecoming and a reversal of my family's historic migration pattern. You know, things only a genealogist would really get excited about, but uh, coming back and, and seeing all of these headstones and the local cemeteries with my kind of uncommon German maiden name is a little bit of a trip, I have to say. Well, you had what a, a whole month at HSP so far, but may I ask what excites you about genealogy at HSP? Yeah. In, in just that month, I really, I'm still learning the size and scope of HSP's collections. I find it astounding, honestly. I think HSP is very underrated and I'm hoping that our renewed emphasis on genealogy raises its profile a bit more. Um, I think there's an understandable misconception that this historical society is only useful to you if you have an interest in history or genealogy in Pennsylvania or maybe even just Philadelphia, but that's very clearly not true as Justina was saying in the introduction. Um, plus there's, you know, keep in mind that Philadelphia was once the nation's capital and so HSP is really well situated for uh, learning a lot of information about the young United States as a whole. Um, but I did have a couple examples. There they are. Um, this, this was, I think, my second or third week here. Um, HSP has thousands of family Bibles and family Bible records, which traditionally among, especially Anglo-Protestant origin families in the United States and elsewhere, um, it was very common for people to use the Bibles, which had these dedicated pages to record information about their family members. And then they would hand these down through the generations. And they're invaluable because Sometimes they can be the only surviving proof of exact birth dates, you know, pre-civil registration and all that. Um, and or the existence of certain family members, children who died young, first wives, that kind of a thing. So um, HSP, sorry, this is a little bit of background. HSP is having its 200th anniversary come up, coming up soon. And in celebration of that, we are publishing a book about our collections, which is super exciting. Um, and I had the privilege of getting to work on part of this book. Um, talking about these family Bible records. And so in preparation, I was in HSP's reading room and spending time just looking through some of these. And uh, there were two in particular that really struck me. Uh, the one on the left you'll see 
was a Wharton family. And I found this interesting because it goes back to a person born in Philadelphia in 1707, which is crazy. And the nice thing about this family Bible, and you can see the value here, is that it, it gives the birthplaces in England and Wales, respectively, of his parents, which can be really hard to prove in that era otherwise. Um, but then on the right, this is the one that was a little bit more of a, uh, an emotional experience for me. This is a Miller family Bible and tucked away in the pages of, I think that's the New Testament, was a lock of hair. And unfortunately, it doesn't say, you know, whose hair that is. There's really no way of knowing. It's kind of a dirty blonde. But, you know, it was a really poignant reminder to me of why I do this. That maybe was hair from someone's child or, you know, a loved one, a spouse. And, you know, there's practical value in knowing history, right? Um, whether on a national scale or personal family, whatever. But anyone who's gotten the genealogy bug can relate to this feeling and knows that there's that undeniable emotional tug going on um, to remember and hope that you're going to be remembered and the people that you love are remembered as well. So in this crazy world, um, these family Bibles help me remember, you know, that genealogy is ultimately a labor of love as well as education. And these Bibles are some of my favorites because they have that strong human touch. They're not those sterile bureaucratic documents that so many other things are. So HSP has Bibles. Come look at them. They're amazing. They're beautiful. Indeed, indeed they are. Um, now, other than the Bibles you've consulted, and again, in your brief, just over one month at HSP, have you made other discoveries in the HSP collections? Well, you mentioned the cookbooks earlier, and I guess that's kind of becoming a theme, but I was really surprised to get to go, you know, explore the stacks and see all these crazy cookbooks. There's, I mean, historic ones, obviously, and then there's also things that are, you know, kind of scream more 50s, 60s, 70s about Jello and Nutella and somehow Baby Bell cheese as well. So that's just kind of a little corner. Like, there's just so many fun things to find. Um, in HSP and it's, I think it's it's a good example of why you shouldn't discount it and think that it might not have something that applies to you because I guarantee you it's got something that applies to you and whatever niche topic you're interested in. Right, there'll always be something of interest even if it isn't your family. Yes. Now, what are some of the immediate short-term plans for genealogy at HSP? Wait, there's, there's a few of them. We're staying pretty busy already. Um, number one, as you can see here, is uh, some programming and volunteer uh, opportunities here. Currently, we're in the middle of the 1950 census transcribe-a-thon, as we're kind of affectionately calling it. Um, for those of you who don't know, but probably experienced in 2020, the US has taken a federal census every decade since 1790. And, um, but for privacy reasons, these are often kept, not often, they are kept private. You can't access the records until 72 years afterward. You can get some statistical data, but the actual images with all of the names and all the fun information is, is restricted. So in April of this year, the 1950 US Census was released. And in partnership with familysearch.org, HSP has launched a volunteer effort to uh, get those records transcribed. Uh, they're using really cool computer technology to get that off the ground, but you can go in and pretty easily and quickly spend time uh, checking that the computer read the names right, that sort of thing. Um, and that makes those records searchable for other people who want to research their family. For a lot of people, 1950 might be the first year that you're um, seeing some of your family on the census, people that you know, which is pretty cool. Um, and like I said, it's easy, doesn't take too much time. We sent out a link in our recent newsletter, but there will be a follow-up email to this presentation as well. That will also have a link to the HSP group if you would like to join. Um, it doesn't take very much time. You can add this to your daily morning Wordle routine and voila, you know, uh, you can do it on the train, on your phone. It's just a simple click, click through and, and you know, you're participating in citizen history. So that's a 1950 census. That's going on through at least July, so there's time. Um, the other thing that I'm really excited about is this four-week entry-level Genealogy 101 course that I'll be teaching starting at the end of June. 
Um, this will be over Zoom, though there's, there may end up being a uh, one on-site aspect to it, that's TBA. Um, so, you know, if you're interested, if you're feeling like you're kind of on the entry level and you're, you're wanting to just get a pretty thorough look at how to get started, how to know you're doing it right, I believe that launched today. So you can sign up for that, um, both friends of HSP and the general public. So we look forward to seeing you on that. Um, and of course, in the second half of the year, there's also going to be lots of other programs, uh, monthly lectures, that sort of thing. So keep an eye on our social media and events calendar on at hsp.org and, and find out about what's coming up. These, these are the two most recent, but there will be lots more. Um, I also wanted to put in a shout out about our research by mail program, which is something I think is great coming from a research background myself. You know, there are a lot of people in this lecture who uh, don't live in Pennsylvania or don't live in Philadelphia, and it can be a little bit hard to get here. So if, if you still need to take advantage of what HSP has, we have researchers on site here that can do that for you. Um, remember that HSP's collections consist of over 21 million items, so the odds of you finding something that's pertinent to you, like Sandy said, are, are pretty high. Um, and that's personalized research. So that's something I'm very excited about and, and want to remind everyone that it exists. Um, and of course, lastly, we are open. COVID, you know, it's been a weird couple of years, um, but the library is open for research. It's currently still by appointment only, but don't let that put you off. Usually we can almost always find ways to accommodate you. You can come in, um, call in first or send us an email and get on our research list. And you can come in and use our reading room, or our computers. Um, and of course, keep in mind also that if you join Friends of HSP, which is a really great program, um, you get free uh, daily access to, to HSP uh, for a year and a bunch of other perks as well. You know, access to exclusive digital databases, discounts on lectures, um, all kinds of things. So consider that and please come visit us. Wow, that's wonderful, Katie. One more question, if I might. Are there any plans in the Hopper for in-person programs yeah. in 2022? Yes, yeah, so we're still working on some details there, but uh, HSB has had some in-person events already in the last few weeks, even that I've been able to be a part of, and um, that is going to resume, yeah. Well, that's very good good news for, I guess, Philadelphia in general, more places are opening their doors now. Yeah, for sure. And what, what goals have you had a chance to think about for HSP down the road in the next oh, one to five years? So I feel really strongly about accessibility. And for that reason, I would like to focus long-term on finding good ways to help increase our digitization efforts. And that serves a dual purpose of making more records available for you, the public, but also preserving these precious you know, historical documents. And you know, the more people who can make use of HSP by visiting us, even if that's just virtually, the better for everybody. Um, it's gonna be a challenging undertaking, but I think that with strategic partnerships with other genealogical entities and also you know, building up our own our own uh, resources. This is going to be a lot of fun. There's so, I mean, it, there's just insane amounts of cool information hiding in the stacks. So um, part of this effort would be requiring a lot more volunteers. So if any of you are in the Philadelphia area and you are really into scanning documents or transcribing documents or who knows what else might come up, um, please be on the lookout for that because we depend a lot on our wonderful volunteers to help us come and, and make these things reality. Um, and kind of along those that same line, I care a lot long-term about ensuring that our collections and offerings are doing a good job of reflecting the diversity of people and experiences that make up the United States, right? Historically, it's just a fact that genealogy has been used to uphold caste systems and has had a tendency to be a practice of the elite primarily. Um, and that leaves a lot of people out. And 
from my years in client research, that's incredibly apparent. Um, it's painfully obvious when you contrast researching some white families versus families of color. Um, women compared to men, historically marginalized communities and people in poverty. So um, as you can see on the screen here, one of the things that I liked about HSP is the dedication it's already had to making sure that the, the digitized records in particular that are available are not just for the prominent. But this, for example, is uh, a transcript from a collection that we have through our encounters database, which is available to uh, friends of HSP from the comfort of their homes or to the general public on site on our computers. But this was a, a home missionary society that went around Philadelphia in the 1880s, and they were providing material relief to a lot of the, the poor folks in, in Philadelphia that were struggling at the time. And this, especially for this period, is sometimes some of the most detailed information you can, you can get about, about these people in the absence of a lot of the other more uh, common records and with the loss of the 1890 federal census. So for example, you've got this one here where um, this husband, wife, and four children are being provided with a quarter ton of coal as part of their relief. If you see at the very bottom under the notes, the husband is sick. And so that's kind of a clue maybe as to why they were struggling financially, even, uh, even got their address and their, and their religion there. So it's, this is a cool collection. This is one of many um, that we have. And this kind of thing is something I'm passionate about ensuring there is more of to make sure that genealogy is not just a hobby that can be enjoyed by, by some people, but that it's something that is available to everyone. I think there's something uh, very healing on an individual level and on a, a larger scale with being able to connect with your roots. So this is a good example of that. <clears throat> and then, oh, this was a good example too. I'm glad that I included this. So HSP has the originals of this amazing 1838 census that was taken of black families in Philadelphia. Uh, Pennsylvania was one of the few states that extended voting rights to black men prior to the Civil War, but in 1838 that was being taken away. And so the census was taken in an effort to document the success and resilience and scope of the black community in Philadelphia. And again, if you know anything about censuses pre-1850, um, there's not always a lot of detail. And so this is, it's got names, it's got occupations. Uh, in this, one of these center columns here, you can tell that it asks about essentially how they got their freedom, whether they were born free or if there were other circumstances that manumitted them. So um, it's just a beautiful, cool resource. We have the originals. It's currently being hosted digitally at Black Docents, um, which is a fantastic initiative as well. And uh, just a, a good example of the partnerships that, you know, we hope to continue to leverage. So I've got my work cut out for me, for sure. Thank you for putting this up. I knew we held this, but this is actually the first time I've seen this census. <laughs> It's very cool, isn't it? And it's very clear and it's beautiful. Um, you mentioned that people can make an appointment online for research at HSP. And you also said if that was booked up to email and you would definitely try to get people in. Um, are you available? to consult with people when they get there to, or other members of, of the staff to guide them and get them started? Yeah, we have a great library staff. We have a reference desk you can come up to and uh, we usually recommend that you start there and talk to our librarians and they can help you pull whatever you need or answer questions about just about anything. They're very, very capable people. So, and we have an online chat as well. And if it's not online at the time that you try to chat, you can submit a ticket, you can submit a question and someone will get back to you. They're usually pretty prompt. So um, yeah, definitely come in. We can get you any of the help that you need. Mm, that's wonderful. Well, thank you, Katie, for your insights into HSP and its goals for genealogists. 
And now I'm going to turn this over to the audience and hope they have put some questions into the Q&A. Mm -hmm. And Justina will take over because she's been monitoring that Q&A. So on to you, Justina. Thank you so much, Sandy. Don't go too far because I think we'll need your help in some of these questions. Um, just before I get started, I think we still have some time. I would love to engage you all in the audience again with a quick little use of the chat. I know I asked you in the beginning where you were zooming in from, but what I'd love to hear right now, and we could sort of see this happening together in the chat, is do you have a location where you were surprised you found an ancestor? So let's say you've been doing some of your work and you uh, doing some of your family history and voila, somebody in your research showed up in an unexpected place. Go ahead and put that in the chat so we can get those stories and we can see them coming in um, and, and share some of your surprises. Uh, Katie talked so wonderful, wonderfully about her experiences and the experiences that she had for her clients and the way genealogy can be healing. Um, it can be fun and surprising too. So share a few stories with us in the chat as we, uh, as we see where surprising ancestors came from. Um, and let's see what we have going on in here. So there's a lot of questions about our um, collections, Sandy, and you know our collections very well. So. Katie, if you're not sure about this yet, we're going to hand this question over to, to Sandy as well. Um, do we, Ray asks, does HSP have info on ships that came to Philadelphia from Europe, maybe where the passengers went upon landing? So, um, Sandy, I'm going to send that to you first. Do you have any great ideas about where um, It's going to depend look? on the time period. The ship's passenger lists are all held by the National Archives. HSP has some microfilm of that and almost all of them, to the best of my knowledge, have been digitized from the microfilm and would be available on our computers at HSP. So if you couldn't get in there, somebody could look it up for you for the research by mail request. Um, Say without knowing the exact time sure. period you're, you're talking about, it's hard to be specific, but the short answer is, is yes, we can help. Great. Yep. And of course, we're talking about time periods where things are not um, necessarily uh, uh, um, made equivalent across the board. So different experiences at different time periods coming from different places around the world would end up in different places. So thank you for that. Uh, Sandy. Uh, Jim Byler's asking if HSP is going to be going on the road to genealogy conferences. Uh, Katie, do you have any thoughts on this? And, and I can jump in then too. I have, have plans. Um, I hesitate to speak too specifically because, you know, some things are still in the works, but yes, conferences are definitely something that we are going to be doing. Um, yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah. So look for us Again, virtually is is a strong uh, silver lining from pandemic, but certainly um, as we gather again in person in various places um, and maybe hybrid. I mean, this is this opportunity where there might be a conference somewhere and you could zoom in. Speakers can zoom into the conference. Um, we're doing that in June. We have speakers coming uh, in from from South Carolina, uh, but then we're also gathering folks on site to do a, a live stream of that webinar and talk to each other. So we're really going to see what the best um, combination is for our schedules, our budgets, our audiences, where we can be reaching um, folks who we know and love and folks that we might want to get to know better, right? Um, okay, Gloria is asking, if I come to Philly, can we schedule help with genealogy? I have some of it done. I have ancestors from Philly that were friends with Abraham Lincoln. That is awesome. I need help pinpointing who this may have been. Is there a cost? My mother is 92 and my last link to any info that she may remember. So Katie, do you want to talk about um, uh, consultations and, and, and plans for that? Yeah, so in the past we've done consultations, one-on-one -on -one personalized uh, consultations with genealogists, and that is something that we're hoping to revamp soon. Um, so 
I don't have details on that yet, but keep an eye out again on our social media channels and on our website. Uh, Those would be something you could sign up for um, with an appointment. They would not be free, I don't think, but, um, you know, we would be happy to help you and and provide you that individual service. Great. Um, And again, if you are not yet a member or not yet uh, connected to our newsletter, hsp.org slash e-news is how we do most of our communications. Um, You can also check the genealogy box uh, when you sign up for our newsletter. And we will be um, starting specific communications with people who are interested. All of you who are attending tonight, for example, um, if if you've joined our mailing list, our newsletter list, you will uh you will hear about these opportunities um first uh okay another one that maybe sandy can help us with or maybe katie you know it do you have records for cambria county cambria county 1900s tax land records um this is ben's creek pennsylvania so cambria county i know uh pennsylvania has 67 counties any ideas of how extensive our collection is for all 67 counties particularly Cambria. Sandy, help us out. Well, I'm pulling out my cheat sheet. I can't get online right now without lousing up to this whole webinar, but let me take a look. We certainly, do we have microfilm of records from all 67 counties in Pennsylvania? Let me say that first. And we concentrated over the years on getting microfilm of the land records and the probate records and church records. Those were the the three primary goals. Uh, What was the township in? Uh, Ben, Ben's, sorry, I'm scrolling down. Ben's Creek, B-E-N-S, Ben's Creek. Okay, was that, do you know what township that was? Ben's Creek, PA, Cambria County. Okay. This sounds like, and I will just emphasize what Katie was saying, um, if you go to our website, hsp.org, right on the landing page, there is this cute little picture that says live chat available. And if you click on that, right, it'll come up right now because we're not, we're not there. You know, the librarians have all gone home for the evening. Um, you can, there's a, there's a link you can click and you can submit these questions and the librarians will get back to you. So sometimes they are there live and get right back to you. And sometimes it goes into like a, you know, like a, a waiting list, uh, uh, a waiting line and they'll get back to you when they get a chance. So these are the sorts of questions. Again, hsp.org, click on the little live chat available. And may I just add, though, even though we might not have had the microfilm in Cambria County, we do. We are a uh, affiliated library with the Family History Library in Salt Lake City. So we have access to what over how many hundreds of millions of microfilm records did they digitize and put on their website? So that would be uh, something anybody could do is go to familysearch.org to their website, put in your county name and see what records they have. And you can always access those uh, at HSP. On site, on site. Um, I think this is a really great question. I really appreciate Joseph for putting this in the in the Q and A. Um, he says, from personal experience and hearing from other genealogists and family historians, some have felt that there is a disconnect between the genealogy community and HSP. Uh, how will you help to change this and to welcome genealogists into the reading room? Uh, Katie, I'm going to just kick this to you first, and you can kick it back to me and Sandy then as soon as you want to. Ooh, that's such a good question. Well, I mean, I want to try to definitely develop the programming to better serve the needs of genealogists and, inc- and increase it, frankly, as well. Um, some of that will be familiarizing myself with HSP's collection so that I can personally be more helpful to people who come and visit. Um, but I also would like to, long. this is another kind of long-term thing, create more opportunities for people to come in and participate, um, help create history, help help them put together genealogies, put, put together audio recordings, something like that. So um, that's, I mean, it's a long-term, 
it's a long-term consideration. And some of this is things that I'm still going to be figuring out as, as I'm here, but um, it is something I care a lot about. Uh, so thank you for asking. Yeah. Joseph, again, thank you for that question. Um, Katie mentioned that we're looking at a 200th birthday, 1824, 2024. And so to get ready for that, we just underwent some strategic planning at HSP. And core to that strategic plan are uh, engaging with family and community historians. Um, part of my vision along with Katie's is this idea of co-creation is how can we learn from our audiences about what they know and then how can we share that back out to the wider community so I think exactly what Katie's saying through programming um, to be able to create opportunities I'm not sure what that looks like yet uh, you know is it blog posts is it programs is it um, you know, going on the road with different conferences and, and gathering testimonies and gathering stories. I love the idea of like having um, a, a, a space where you can share your find when you were in the reading room. What was it that you just discovered that is amazing? Could we capture that story and then, you know, follow up with you to, to have you share that on our social media, on, um, on a, a web platform? We're not sure what the technology is behind it yet, but I think I think um, following through on on the engagement that you have before you get to the reading room, whether it's on a program or um, you know attending a workshop, welcoming you into the reading room, equipping you to use the reading room, and then following up after you use the reading room to to hear how your discovery and your research has been going. Sandy, is there anything you want to add to that conversation? No, I just what you just said is is brilliant to that introduces more people to our collections by telling the story of what people found in collections. Um, as you know, with all of the millions of documents we have, it's impossible to know everything in that library. But when you can read a little story, what somebody found in one of those collections, I think that brings it all home. Yeah, yeah. And again, it's, it encourages other people to do the same types of work. You know, you are, when you get those stories, you're engaging others, you're sort of spreading the word, right? And that's what we- I'm still learning what's in that library after 40 years. Yeah, none of us is an expert. None of us is an expert. I'd like to add to, I think that there's some physical things that are happening at HSP that we're hoping will make it more approachable as well. There's literally a remodel going on that's going to start soon. Um, to try to make the place more inviting. And um, as I talked about earlier, the whole idea of accessibility and expansion of access to uh, genealogical records is something that I care a lot about. And part of that may be expanding the kinds of uh, the, the demographics that we're appealing to and, and the offerings that we have. Maybe one day we'll be able to offer courses on Mexican genealogy in Spanish, you know, just things that try to reach people more where they are. So those are conversations that we're definitely having. Neat. Um, lots of great questions. We're gonna keep, cause I knew, I knew we'd have so many good questions. I knew this would happen. Um, can we access your records remotely online? So do you wanna talk a little bit about Discover, how you use the catalog and then uh, what other opportunities there are for searching at home? Yeah, so we do have this card catalog where you can, you can from the comfort of your home, search and see what kinds of records HSP holds. Now, not all of those are going to be online, but you can get a good idea of what we have in our stacks. If that's something that you need to research by mail, you know, write in for a copy of, whether you can come in and check it out yourself. If you are a member of Friends of HSP, we do have the Encounters database as one of the benefits um, of that membership. You pay a fee per year and you not only get access to you know, HSP on site and to be able to come in for free with us, but uh, you'll have access to these digital databases like the one I showed earlier with the Home Missionary Society with the, the welfare that was happening. Um, you can also access those for free on site at HSP uh, or unfettered, I should say. There is a, an entry fee for non-members, but um, you can come and sit at our computers and use those. But from the comfort of your home, that kind of requires you to be a member of Friends of HSP, which is, I think, worth doing. Sandy, anything you want to add to that? 
I, yes, I would like to uh, mention that the card catalogs, the actual cards that were created starting in you know, 1824 with notations from librarians on them were digitized by family search. And if you're looking for something to do, there's over a million cards that you can go through on their website if you can't get to HSB and it'll give you an overview this is of our manuscript collection, which is just incredible. I always uh, think of this as my inspiration when you're wanting to look for a new record, go through those cards and you just don't know what you're going to find that we have that is sitting in our library and you can access that from home. Um, and I, Selena put in the chat uh, how to, to become a member. Uh, membership starts at $100. So do the math. We hope it's not transactional. We hope you're also supporting us so we can, you know, do more digitization, do more programming. But um, but uh, you can you can check that out for yourself. Uh, a couple more questions, just of like what our records entail. Tara's asking, do we have pension records from the Revolutionary War from Rhode Island? And if not, do we have any ideas where to find them? This is one of those great like lib chat questions. <laughs> so if you, if Sandy and, and Katie, you don't know this, we'll encourage Tara to use the live chat. But if you do, Sandy, do you know if we have pension records from the Revolutionary War from Rhode Island? We do not have the originals. We have an index. I believe it's three volumes in our library, uh, abstracts of all of the Revolutionary War pension. And if you find something there, uh, yes, the Revolutionary War pensions have been digitized and they are available online. Somebody also just reminded us that JSTOR is also included in what we, um, what we provide for HSP Friends, which is very significant. Um, Oh, this is a great question too. Uh, questions between HSP and GSP, the Genealogical Society of Pennsylvania. Um, do we have plans to strengthen our relationship with them and, um, and, and how we interact with them as well? Yeah, uh, we've already started having conversations about possible joint programming in the near future. Again, I hate to keep saying I don't have a lot of details right now, but you know, cut me a little slack. I am still pretty new. Uh, we, yeah, there's definitely plans to, to coordinate there. I think that putting our powers together is, will benefit everybody. So I'll add that the Genealogical Society of Pennsylvania newsletter came out today and they devoted a couple pages to HSP, including their introduction of Katie. So yes, collaboration is happening. That's great to hear. Um, the, 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 on that same topic, somebody asked about the communication between HSP, the library company, and the Athenaeum, and the APS, the American Philosophical Society, and the Free Library uh, of Philadelphia. I think I'm going to take that first, and then if you, Sandy and, and Katie you want to follow up on that. Um, for those of you who know us, know that the Library Company of Philadelphia is directly next door to us. We actually um, house each other's objects, and so you can be doing research in one reading room and request an object from the other reading room, so obviously the, the connection is very tight there. Uh, we are working with APS, American Philosophical Society, and LCP, our neighbor, on a, a project called Revolutionary City which is this massive digitization project of, uh, I forget the number now, of the thousands of documents that were created in the 1770s. Every document from the 1770s, not just ones related to the war. It could be a cookbook. It could be um, a receipt book uh, from somebody's household documenting the lived experience of Philadelphia in that time period. So that that is work that's happening now. 80% of those records are at HSP. Um, and we will be utilizing, we will de be deploying that database for a whole suite of programming and development of educational resources in time for 
250, the semi-quincentennial 2026. So there is a lot of partnership between those organizations. Um, free library is, a, is an opportunity I'd love to pursue more for partnerships. We have members of our uh, board of trustees who are involved with the free library as well. So lots of lots of great partnerships. Sandy or Katie, anything you want to add about our fellow research libraries? Do you want to mention the little hidden tunnel at the library <laughs> company? I wouldn't call it a me? tunnel. It's a <laughs> door. It's a door. There's literally a door between the between the two buildings. <laughs> uh, no, I have nothing to add, but very exciting. Uh, collaborations that you just spoke of. So that's good to know. Uh, somebody asked about prison records in Pennsylvania. And I'm bringing that up, Sandy, because I know the Collections and Programs Committee uh, meeting that we had last week, we talked about prison records and we talked about uh, uh, microfilm copies, right? Of Eastern State and Western State Penitentiary. Do you remember that conversation? Mm hmm We, um, some are, some of those prison records are at the state archives in Harrisburg. I um, believe HSP has some of the, the Eastern State Penitentiary records, as does the state archives. They're kind of scattered. But again, we need to know, you know, which part of the country, um, uh, which part of the state I shouldn't say I should say not the the, the country uh, to determine what prison records you might need. Katie, do you remember what we said in that meeting? Sorry, I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> um, I remember that it was a pretty big collection, and we were kind of it was to be determined what exactly that contained because some of it might be genealogically relevant like actual names of prisoners and mm -hmm. stuff and mm -hmm. some of it is just more administrative so we've still got to go through all that and, and figure out what it is mm -hmm. first uh, but yeah i think probably starting with figuring out where the prison is is, is step one yeah i think um what is important and you've said this a number of times and you know with the bibles all the way through um the ship manifests and the the revolutionary Order pensions we have copies and we have um you know, digitized copies and microfilm copies of things that exist in other places. So I think the one-stop shopping really gets you to that idea that it's not like we necessarily have the records. They may be in archives throughout the country, but a lot of these, uh, you know, you'll be able to access when you're on site. So um, one or two more questions. Um, uh, we talk, we, there's some excitement going on about the, the course this summer, starting in June, Tuesday evenings in June. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit more about that and how it might be different than uh, former programs or, you know, scaled down or scaled out or differently um, offered and what really people are going to walk away with from that four-week course? Yeah, I mean, I think scaled, I don't want to say that it's scaled down. It is short. Okay. Like the previous one was, I think, eight weeks, right? And this one is is four. Um, this is also just, we're hoping to have it be more accessible to more people by having it in the evenings. Um, these seem like small things, but it makes a difference for a lot of people who wouldn't have been able to attend um, the previous iteration because it was more of a daytime thing. So, um this is going to be, I'm hoping to have this be a little bit more discussion based, you know, have some breakout rooms, have this be a more of a collaborative kind of thing and really keep it kind of focused on, on basics here. So, um, I'm excited to yeah. host it with you, uh, Katie, because, um, you know, you're from BYU with undergraduate degree in genealogy from BYU uh, with just extensive amounts of knowledge and experience. Uh, and as a person who doesn't have these this knowledge, it's an intro class. I mean, it's a sort of thing that anybody can take and get us started. You know, I've done it a little bit on my tree, but certainly not. Um, I don't know all of the skills of how do I, you know, break through this brick wall? Where do I need to confirm this? Who is who, you know, what are records that um, will really help me answer that? So I feel like as an intro class, it's going to be what an intro class is, really helping you get started. 
Yeah, if you, I mean, if you're poking around trying to figure out how to do genealogy on the internet, it's a little bit like drinking from a fire hose. So I'm hoping that this class will help kind of narrow that down. A, a lot of people will get started then kind of feel like, I don't know if I'm doing it right. You know, I don't know if I'm identifying the right people. I don't know if how to know that what I'm, how to verify these stories that I've heard, that sort of thing. So um, we're definitely going to be talking a lot about that um, and helping people build confidence, I think. And then you know, use those skills to move on into more advanced phases or, you know, whatever they might want to do with that. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, we're just about out of time. There's a lot more questions. I hope people took a chance to read through the chat because there's a lot of good conversation going back and forth. Uh, I'll share the rest of these questions with, with Katie and Sandy um, afterwards. So we can, you know, we can try to get answers out to some of them. Uh, especially if your name is in the in the Q&A. And again, we're going to be following up with the ways to access the 1950 census, the ways to um, join the Rooted Genealogy 101 course. Um, connecting with us on hsp.org slash enews is great. And, uh, and really activating social media. So, you know, we know a lot of folks are on Facebook and that seems to be a place that uh, family historians gather. So look for us there as well. Um, I really want to thank everybody for joining us tonight and especially our members, our friends. Without your support, we couldn't be offering programs like this or services uh, such as we, we do for family historians and genealogy researchers. Um, Katie, Sandy, thank you so much. Um, I will say one more thing just as we're out of time. There was some questions about your dachshunds real quick. Is your sugar face a golden or a setter? Does that make sense? <laughs> I don't know. He's a mess. That's what he is. I don't okay. know. <laughs> Sorry. I did want to honor the, uh, the, the love and interest that we have in our community for our pets and how much they have uh, held us in these past two years. So for thank real. you, Libby, for that question. Mm -hmm. So, all right, friends, thank you so much again for joining us. Have a wonderful evening. Be in touch with us. Um, programs at hsp.org is the email you can always reach us at. Uh, we will uh, get you answers to your questions that are about programs programs, hsp.org with the live chat available, the lib answers will get you uh, your library uh, questions answered. Have a great evening. Thank you so much, everyone. Good night. Good night.